Welcome. This is um, a presentation on ghost voices using text-to-speech technology to improve the quality of learning online. This is Dr. Sherry Hutchinson. I'm with Read Speaker, and I also am a computer science faculty at North Hennepin Community College. And this is, go ahead. Karen LaPlante. I'm IT and business faculty at Hennepin Technical College. And the both of us have been working together for a number of years, and we use the platform Brightspace. So what we discovered as we've been um, teaching for the last few years, um, um, we found that a lot of times students, you know, maybe haven't been reading the materials that we had posted online. We've received a lot of complaints that my students don't ever read my syllabus and, and this type of thing. And so what we... Um, took a look at is the fact that maybe our students needed a little bit more help with reading. Um, maybe they were a little overwhelmed with it. Um, maybe there were some hidden um, disabilities that you know even they didn't really understand or know how to work with. So what we have looked at incorporated at um, uh, both of our campuses and at several other campuses here um, in Minnesota has been text-to-speech technology read speaker. And I have liked it so much that um, when they asked me to join them, I went ahead and joined them because I felt it was so important. Um, I had been in special education for five years um, prior to going back into higher education, and I just found that this technology and the whole factors of universal design that we'll talk about were so essential for our students. We also believe that the bimodal learning, being able to see and follow along really helps um, a number of our students. And we'll tell you which ones it helps. So in this session, we kind of define the newest accessibility slash universal design as it's applied to quality um, learning environments. We're going to discuss a little bit about class and student outcomes, um, identify some of the typical materials that we use in our classroom and online, and how they apply to different ab abilities and this whole universal design theory. And then we'll also determine opportunities to enhance learning for diverse populations um, where TTS is already being used. So we're not going to go too far in, to in depth on accessibility, but we're going to talk about how accessibility relates to and is part of universal design and ADA. So these three terms are really tossed around quite a bit. Um, sometimes universal design is seen as just being accessibility when that's not really what it is. So accessibility may have a very narrow definition, kind of focused around uh, individual student accommodations. Um, there may be some very specific technology tools that a student will need that only that student would need. We wouldn't equip, for instance, all cars um, for wheelchairs when um, that is a very specific accommodation. Same thing when you start applying that to technology. So it really focuses accessibility on the services, on products, and the environment. Universal design, so Dr. Mace, who um, is an individual who is an architect from North Carolina, he actually coined the term universal design. And so originally it was looking at just the general environment being accessible. And universally designed, so curb cuts for instance, are a typical example of a um, architectural design that that's now available for all of us to enjoy. So whether we're biking, pushing a stroller, or utilizing a wheelchair, we have the ability to cross the street easily. Same thing with um, closed captions and technology. Um, Text-to-speech, um, taking into consideration different learning preferences, these are not accommodations because there are many uses and we're going to talk about the text-to-speech in particular as having multiple uses and not just an accommodation for a specific learning disability. It's something that we need to consider and we need to design in. And of course, um, ADA, there are key provisions in the ADA that um, impact universal design and those relate to the fact that um, there's program accessibility and equally effective communications written specifically into the ADA requirements for us on campuses. 
So what we're really trying to do is we're really trying to create quality learning experiences. Um, we want improved accessibility, which is not only for the students with disabilities, like I had stated, but this is something that improves the quality for all learning. Um, improving this accessibility can really help us on campuses have a competitive advantage over those institutions that are not providing the same accessibility. Universally designed products and tools improve this whole quality of the content of our learning experiences. And access via mobile devices, we all know how essential that is um, in our current connected society. We've both discussed um, as faculty that many of our students try to take their entire online courses or hybrid courses completely um, on their mobile devices. So this is something that we have to have technologies that can adapt to this and are available for mobile users. A really big one is about improving um, outcomes. And so typically when we look at improving outcomes, we look at the classroom and we look at, okay, we must increase the success. I have to get that C or above. We have to get them to stay in school, the intention, uh, the retention, excuse me. Um, and they have to get better grades. And so we look at this. But when in reality, um, what Karen and I have found is we actually are looking at improving the student first, and then those other three things actually do go along with this. So rather than just looking at the grades and the pass rate and the attendance, we suggest you start looking at the self-efficacy improvement, the motivation, the confidence, and the resourcefulness of the students. And Karen, you had a great story um, when we had been discussing this before about um, just this, the self-efficacy improvement of your students when you incorporated this last fall. Yes, when, we, when I began it last fall, um, many students are used to accommodations, but we have students that struggle um, behind the scenes that we don't know about. And after I introduced Reed Speaker and showed them how it worked, um, they came back to me, several of them, and said they, they're dyslexic and they have to read things five times but this way, they could listen to it. They could listen to it on their mobile phone. They could listen to it, read it, listen to it, and they really got it. They were so excited. They were so engaged and so feeling good about themselves. Like I said, that they knew they were going to do better. So all of a sudden, they went from like a C student that was struggling to the possibility they knew that A was in their reach. And they were just so engaged and so excited. And these are adults that had never really talked about their, what I would call sort of hidden, hidden disabilities. And um, one of the students wasn't um, born in this country. so. It was added to them a little bit of learning, but a lot of language problems. So just hearing it and being able to hear it as many times as they wanted um, in a language they were comfortable with, not a robot, that really got my students excited and they became engaged. So as a teacher, when my students are more engaged, I feel better. I'm more engaged. The whole class is better. Yeah, you're so right about that. And you brought up the robot voices, too, and we're going to talk about that in a little bit, too. You know, the biggest reason for our talking about ghost voices is those robots are really definitely ghosts of the past. And so we kind of have a little play on words and stuff there, too, as well. You know, one of the other things that you and I talked about, too, is, you know, what do we really know about our students sometimes on our campuses? And I really found... Um, Henry Kelly, you know, the president of the Federation of the American Scientists, his statement that the, do the cookies on my daughter's computer know more about her interests than her teachers do. And so, you know, like for Karen and I, we took that as kind of like, oh, this is an insult. We feel like we really know our students. And we just want to emphasize how important it is to really know about your students. And here are some hidden things that both of us have experienced teaching. And we found our students saying thank you for, you know, for actually going out and, and finding these products for us because we had no idea that this was happening and it's made our lives so much easier. So when you um, take a look at what's happening on your campuses and stuff, you really need to look at the different ability considerations. So there's a number of illiteracy, illiterate students. Um, there's a lot of hidden dyslexia. Dyslexia is not often um, diagnosed. And so struggling readers are oftentimes 
really, you know, they, they don't have access to the resources. A lot of these students were English language learners um, or even right here in our own state, um, and they have not um, had access to computers constantly, whether it's at home or in school and never have had access to um, Texas Speech technology to be able to see the improvements that they are within our courses. So there's also low vision or no vision students, you know, and those are considerations too for having text to speech, speech directly built in. A lot of low vision um, individuals, you know, may have um, some products that they're already using, but a lot of them really kind of expect that a lot of this is already, and we are required to already have this within our learning platforms. So of course we also consider deaf or hard of hearing students. And then some of these other cognitive or other disabilities that are diagnosed or not diagnosed. We also consider these whole differences in demographics. So um, different gender, economic status um, makes a really big difference as we're considering you know, what technologies and what tools to have available immediately for our students. Uh, working adults are often multitasking, and like we talked about, you know, we've both been able to find a lot of our students, um, they really never had in school the opportunity to, um, to, to take a look at technologies that would actually help them be more successful. They just never had access to that. Things have really changed dramatically, and, and both Karen and I in our IT fields have seen that in the last five years, haven't we, Karen? A little bit of change in IT. Definitely. Yeah. For sure. So family status, um, nationality, religion, there's a lot of different things that we need to consider um, when we are selecting these technologies. And so then it comes down to how we can help. And so basically it comes down to we are not all the same. We're different people. We have different learning needs. And that's where universal design um, is taken into consideration for students. And I think that's the part the students like. They don't have to be declared having a disability. So it's not an accommodation, but it's, it's equal access for anyone. So they don't have to. Many, work, many students that are adults don't want to disclose that they have, have a slight learning disability or they're dyslexic or whatever the reason. And it may never have even been diagnosed. They don't want to have to ask for accommodations. This way, like I said, it's equal access for anyone. And if you try it and you find that having speech to text works for you, you've got it made. And then you just hope all your teachers will do that. That's what you hope. That's what you hope is that it's right embedded into the content for you. And you don't have to go searching for it because the more a student has to go searching for it, the less likely they're going to be to use. So I always do let you know, too, as you're you know, looking at your campus and some of the guidelines. So some of the early guidelines that are out there right now um, are really developed in the K-12 um, area. And that's a set framework. And you can take a look at CAST.org. So the set stands for student. Um, the E stands for environments. The T stands for tasks. And the second T stands for tools, so abilities, tools, and goals. And so take a look at um, Joy Smiley Zabala, um, Dr. Zabala has um, great resources out on the internet on the SET framework if you just Google that. And you'll get some ideas uh, and some materials that you can kind of begin to um, incorporate this entire framework into your campus and you know maybe make a, a, a nice document and checklist for yourselves too. So the reason we really got into a lot of this is both Karen and I years ago as we, because we're early adopters of online, um, and so I'm sure these will sound familiar to you too. The first thing that faculty members wanted to do really was to replace the audio. And I'm sure that's the same for you, Karen. Yep. Yep. Definitely. So we were doing podcasts, lots of podcasts, putting up audio. And of course, then, you know, we had to, to script it for those that weren't able um, to hear that or who were at work and needed to use um, a headset, but they didn't have a headset, so they needed something written to be able to take a look at it. Um, so we were creating a lot of MP3s. Um, uh, also, you know, that's the whole popularity behind the whole iTunes U. And at that time, 
one of the easiest to use tools was GarageBand, you know, and shortly after um, Audacity, we didn't put that on the list here, but Audacity was another one that they were creating podcasts with. I still have, um, I think both of us, in fact, have students um, creating audio within some of these, um, these tools as well because we just didn't have the, the technology that we have now. So um, audio has been something that students have needed for a long time, and we've been you know, kind of struggling to replace it because you really do need to be able to see and hear at the same time and really to look at diverse audiences. So I'm going to take a look, and you can um, navigate as well um, after this presentation or now to readspeaker.com, and I will show you, let me move my screen a little bit here. So here we are um, at the main page of readspeaker.com and what we have here is um, a demo on the right hand side and if you click on that you can actually type in some text and then you can select the language so you can see the various languages that are available. So we're in the state so and both of us are girls so we're going to do the American female voice and let's see how this um, Sounds for you. Welcome to this presentation. We are glad you are learning about universal design improvements. And so the voice is a voice that is very natural sounding, um, very much a voice that um, sounds like a human. So it's not the the robot voices. Um, I do know that people who are using those types of products, they're so used to it that it's easier for them at this point. But those people that are um, now experiencing low vision or going into a no vision or having difficulties as they're getting older, um, the individuals really want to have a voice that sounds very natural. And they want to be able to um, to be able to see and hear. So let's just take a look again at um, what this product actually does. So you have a listen button. This goes on websites and it goes in the learning management system. And what you do is you can just select and then you can click and it's instantly there for you. The benefits of text-to-speech. Text-to-speech technology offers several benefits for content owners and publishers as well as their content consumers. So, what you see is that um, the technology, you can download this as an MP3 and listen to just the audio. But you also have the option to change some of the settings as well. And one of my favorite settings for some of my older students who are having um, vision issues is, and they're also having um, issues with reading, is I turn on the enhanced text and they like this feature because, and I click the listen button, so you can see that um, it actually goes through and it lets the, um, the reader be able to follow along in a very large size. Let me just stop that. And it's much easier to have a very large size like this to be able to follow along word by word and be able to understand. So you can picture your terminology. Um, being able to go through a list of the terminology like um, you know, Karen and I with our um, technology courses, um, we have a lot of terminology. And so students enjoy being able to go through this, listen to terms or even to, to download it and use it offline. So we have a couple of different products. The one that I was just showing you was the ReadSpeaker Enterprise, and that reads HTML. We also have um, DocReader, which goes in and reads your documents, your PDFs, your PowerPoints. Um, within the learning management system, it's excellent. I don't find that I have students that are no longer reading the syllabus. What I usually find is they're reading it sometimes too well and they're finding all the typos for me, which I think is fabulous because, I mean, that's really what we're trying to teach um, our IT folks is really how to go in and um, be able to um, find errors in the script. So they may as well find it in ours too as well. Correct, Karen? <laughs> Because yeah, I leave a few typos because I try to um, I, I try to go a little too fast, like most people do too. And then we also have 
a ReadSpeaker text aid, which is um, available also as an LTI integration or as a personal tool for personal learning on the web where you can upload documents to um, your own device. And it can travel on your phone, on your iPad. It can go basically with the individual students. So if they get used to it in the learning management system, there's also a product available for them where they can have that available on any of their devices, their iPad, their laptop, whatever. So, Karen, I'm going to um, have you take a uh, look and talk a little bit about your Brightspace. Um, here we are in a course announcement and how you introduce this to your students. Well, we got it um, towards the end of last semester, in the fall, so there wasn't a lot of time to do much, so I did post it in, on my bulletin board in my news and just told them what ReadSpeaker was and gave them a little one-page handout um, that they could open and read. Not knowing it was so close to finals, not knowing if students would really do it, or I'd have to reintroduce it in January when they came back. But the ones that did take advantage of it right away really enjoyed it. They could um, review uh, my lecture notes, my PowerPoints, and have it read to them, and they were astounded. Now, not every teacher at the school did that, so my students would then say, well, why can't we have it in all the classes? Said, well, you do, but you know, just go look for it. And so then they realized that they didn't have to wait for the announcement. Once they knew about it and could look for that little listen button, they were set. So it worked out very well, even though it was kind of a, a soft rollout, so to speak, because it was at the end of the semester. Yeah, and that's when we always worry if they're going to be able to actually see our resources. So here's another one in one of your courses, too, of what you were having them be able to navigate through. So do you want to talk anything about um, you're in the content area. So in uh, Brightspace, right. this is uh, available in the content area for reading. Right, and um, these are web pages, and they can click on the link, and you know whatever out there will be read to them. So that was just an example of um, some security things in a, in a course that I have. Mm -hmm. And you can also see that if this was a document, this is where we had the actual, you would just click here and you can open it actually with Doc Reader, and um, then they'd be able to go through, and that's the point that they'd be able to um, to download as an MP3 if you had a lot of terminology and wanted them to review it, that would be a great opportunity for students to do that. So what we had brainstormed about too was um, some of the typical classroom materials that everybody has available. So both of us really in the traditional or the online classroom because there's really this merge now of um, the, what was once called the traditional classroom, you're using, um, for your traditional cr classes, you're also using the um, learning management system, correct, to put your handouts and, and what other things? Definitely. Yep. So handouts, PDFs, uh, links to other information, um, assignment overviews, even in a traditional classroom, um, we are all putting these materials out to students, so being able to to go through and have our notes read to them um, is really important because they're getting that extra ability to understand us much better. I mean, textbook, um, students will have various software for our courses that they need. Um, and for a number of our courses, too, they'll have different hardware that they might have to have. Um, and as they're navigating websites, having the ability to have the websites read to them is really important, too. And many of our books are going more online ebooks and working with different various publishers. Many of them already had ReadSpeaker built in. So the students saw it on the publisher side, and now they see it on the, on the faculty or instructor side, too. So it, it's been a win-win for all of us. Oh, it really has. So, because um, if you're not familiar with um, Brooklyn Park, um, we are a very diverse um, community. And so, um, with our diverse, we have very diverse classroom opportunities for such a variety of students. So, adding these visual and these audio enhancements to our curriculum has been really important for us. Um, and you saw that with the publishers as well. The publishers that we're um, using are really reaching out to these students with the different learning styles. Um, we find that there's so much reading to do anymore for students. There always has been, but this really helps even with um, the uh, reading fatigue, the multitaskers, being able to, to listen along to something as you are doing another task, vacuuming or driving to work or those types of things on the bus in the morning. is That's been very important for our students. Um, and then again, it gets around to what we've talked about before, the whole bimodal learning. 
And you know, a couple of words that have been really um, tossed around have been adaptive, personalized, differentiated. Um, so if you're working in areas like that and you want to be able to apply these universal design techniques, this is one of the things that we found to do that for us. And you know, there's really um, a lot of discussion, and we've had a lot of discussion ourselves around what are these options for learning with, with audio, and we've really found it useful for our diverse student populations. And really, you know, like we have in the image here, really our future of education. So we've been really excited to add this to our courses. Because all of us have been facing high attrition, we have um, huge populations, both of us in our classes, um, of returning adult students, um, and we have a lot of struggling readers, so we are seeing huge um, improvements for our students. We have very high English language learner populations, and both of our campuses have very high academic development um, numbers of courses being taught. So um, this is definitely for those of us that have, um, that have um, high diverse populations. Um, one of the things that um, I always suggest to take a look at, and I will have as a link as well, is um, take a look at, we do not pay our students to do this, but there's a number of students that have um, um, uploaded testimonials on you know, what they've been doing with um, ReadSpeaker. And so when we do these presentations in person, we, we demonstrate some of these videos and people really, um, really enjoy being able to see a student um, talk about how they've been using it. So our student, Hubert in particular, um, he downloads it and so he is a non-native English speaker and studying and so there's lots of reading for him and he will download an mp3 and he bought a um, an underwater recording and uh, listening device and so he does listen to his materials while he's swimming which I thought was kind of a, a fun way of um, of learning um, but it it just shows you that this is a for a diverse learning um, preferences diverse learning styles um, diverse populations so really what it has done and what you can see from some of the testimonials is we've really um, worked on the student self-efficacy of improving their motivation, having them be able to see results. I mean, both of us have had students um, say to us that we're, they're so glad that they have this ability to be able to listen and watch the um, text that's in their courses, and we're watching a huge improvement in their self-esteem as well. And we have lots of uh, stories of um, success that you know we've kind of shared in this presentation as well. And we really wanted something for our students that was very easy to use. It was a simple click. Um, it was easy for us to incorporate into our learning management system. And we really wanted to improve the um, accessibility for our students and to um, have an opportunity to um, add to our universal design plan because we really do want um, our students to be readers and this has really helped our students a lot. Especially since it requires no download, no account, no password, no login. It's just click a button and you're there. So it is so extremely easy. It's valuable. And like I said, all of us are um, in this budget crunch having to retain our students and to retain a student they have to be motivated. To get them motivated I have to engage them. The best way I can engage them is if they feel good about themselves and what they're learning. That they can see a future out there. So like I said it, it starts with what we give them and they, they will expect it not as an accommodation but just as another way to learn and they take it from there and get engaged and then motivated and then they're more successful and then we retain them. So it's kind of the circle. Yeah. Back. And I, th I felt that it was very uh, cost effective because um, to recruit a student typically will cost you more than what it is to, to have um, a license of this. So it was very exciting to be able to find this, this particular product and how easy it is and that we can track it. You know, we have analytics that we can see how much the students are using and we have all these materials to be able to tell our students and our faculty about it as well, which has been really great. 
And so you can take a look on the website and look at um, some of the bimodal learning articles that are available because I think that always helps us as, you know, we're talking to our stakeholders of why are we doing this again? You know, because both of us have experienced the same thing and we were able to, to take a lot of these materials and a lot of the research that's out there and be able to show that this really is um, providing our struggling readers with the privacy because they do deserve privacy when um, and that really is truly providing what's called equal access and that's really what um, the ADA has been looking for is equal access for students and like we talked about before there's a number of publisher resources that are already using so you'll find within your ProQuest your EBSCO host your Cengage MindTap and a number of other publishers that there's already um, reading um, and uh, listening the audio is already embedded so the text-to-speech technology is already there for you so this in particular with these outcomes so Texas Tech um, was using MindTap which has um, which also has the read speaker embedded in it and there's an 87 percent success rate in the course which was an increase of over 26 percent over there those using other particular products um, that just didn't happen to have the same um, built-in technologies and again I kind of talked about um, take a look at cast.org take a look at their most recent book which was just published in 2016 and that's the Universal Design for Learning, Theory and Practice with Gordon and Meyer. And it talks about a simple example um, for students uh, for differentiating and being able to um, have text-to-speech reading can allow for students with the same social studies text regardless of their decoding ability. So take a look at what um, Universal Design is discussed at the cast.org site as well and um, take a look at the different learning management systems that are available um, to be able to incorporate and the publishers options and I've kind of shown you a little bit about you know how you can um, customize it and so an individual students can change color, change color they can speed it up they can slow it down they can increase the text visibility so the student really um, feels like they're in control of their reading and we um, just invite you to, um, you know, send us questions. And um, we're really glad that we had this opportunity to let you know about um, this particular product. And we've been pretty excited about it. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's been great. So I thank you, Karen. And um, I will be talking to you again soon. Thank you.